Welcome to MWeb's Entrepreneur Zone. Today I've got Mike from Architects of Justice with me. Welcome, Mike. Hi, right, morning. Good to be with you. Tell us a bit more about your business. So it, it basically started three years ago. Uh, it, it's myself, two other guys, Kuba and Alessio. Okay. We all studied together at Wits University. Um, and then over the next couple of years after we graduated, we all worked together at different companies at different times. And we reached a point where we wanted to be more challenged. We felt that the places we were working weren't giving us the design challenges that we were looking for. And we actually set up a company to do some competitions because we had no clients. We did one local competition and we did one international competition. And following those, we then acquired a project. And uh, since then, we've been practicing as the Architects of Justice. Yeah. Tell us a bit more about the, the name. It's an interesting one. When we sat down and we started discussing the name, there was the obvious, you know, take your surnames, put them into a pile, and go so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so -and -so architects. And the more and more we looked at it, we figured we'd just be thrown into a pile with a bunch of other guys. And uh, we were chatting and we were like, how do we make our name a little bit more bold, a little bit more prominent? And uh, one of us threw out Architects of Justice and we figured that would be a good name to go with. It uh, also gives us a good mission statement in that we need to do justice to what we actually do as a profession. And uh, it should set us apart from the other guys, you know, which are of, of, of and architects. In terms of building your reputation in the market, starting out, as you say, you had no clients. How have you gone about building that reputation? The biggest thing has just been to constantly provide a good quality of service and really trying not to drop the ball on, on any front. With starting a, a professional services firm, one of the difficulties is around cash flow, getting money in, managing how you um, charge and how you get your revenue in. How have you gone about that? Uh, the one big thing which I noticed and, and I think which we all noticed when we worked for other guys was architects are a little bit shy to actually invoice for the work they do because a lot of it revolves around love for work. and. Um, the one conscious decision we made was that once we do work, we constantly invoice for it. And thus far, we actually haven't had many or in fact any bad payers. So cash flow wise, we've been quite okay. And uh, to start with, we also, we integrated ourselves into the business slowly. Alessio was the first partner who worked there. Kuba then stepped in a couple of months later. And then a year later, I stepped in full time. So it's, it's been a gradual step up. Also our office space, we never rented anything really big. In the beginning, we were in Kuba's Lounge, and uh, I think about a year and a half ago, we moved, into, we moved into our own premises, which we're in at the moment. And do you go with the traditional pricing model, or how have you worked out your pricing? Yeah, so we price based on the SACAP tariff fees. The SACAP is the South African Council for the Architectural Profession, and um, we generally try to stick to that. And is that based on a percentage of build value, or how does that? Yeah, so that's that's based on your your project cost. So your, if your project cost is say a million, then there's a percentage which you take on that, and then there's a base fee which adds to that. In a the three of years partners, um, and you're in a relatively creative industry, how do you manage the tensions between yourselves? With there being three of us, the the good news is if you put anything to a vote, it generally goes two and then one. And whoever's sitting with the one, well, he draws the short straw and needs to accept that it's uh, that that's the way it is. Um, the one place where we we do kind of differ a little bit on that is that when it comes to financial decisions, that needs to be a three-way agreement on any financial decision. A lot of people, when they build, they don't find it an enjoyable experience. Um, and these are your clients. How do you manage that client relationship and ensure that you have people that are happy with what you've produced? It, it is something which definitely comes up. What we also find is, you know, when you're designing, there's a lot of excitement which happens. Then there tends to be a frustration when it goes to a local authority approval process because it's uncertain how long it may take. And if there are certain things like building line relaxations or heritage issues on the building, that particular portion becomes very uncertain then generally there's a lot of jubilation when you start to break ground. And uh, somewhere, somewhere where you start to get to the point where the building is up, but not quite up and not quite finished, a lot of clients tend to get a lot of remorse and they feel like they, they, they're, not, uh, they're not getting to where they want to be going, which, uh, at which point you really then need to provide some comfort and ensure them that this is something which everybody goes through and this is a point where you know, like it's, it's make or break and that everything is going to be okay. And although you might, be, you might have some tension on site with contractors or professionals or between ourselves and the client, that 
what actually happens is that at the end of the project, when it is up and everything looks great and it's amazing and they get to move into their building, it all gets forgotten about very quickly. In, in establishing your business, um, have you chosen to specialize or have you been open to any type of clients? We've been open to a, a myriad of clients. I suppose we've, we've consciously decided to specialize in not specializing. And uh, the idea there being that you know, it keeps us in the market for a mix of projects and it also it, it creates a lot of excitement in terms of what you actually work on because you're not continuously working on the same kind of project over and over again with the same kind of details. It lets us explore different options, different materials, technologies. And you've actually broadened out to beyond just architectural design. You do other type of design as well? Yeah, we do, we do some other design. Um, we've gotten involved in some industrial design, which has been more on a needs basis for ourselves, where we've you know, designed office furniture for ourselves, where if we need presents for people for weddings or for birthdays, we go out and design a purpose-made item and have it made up for them. So it's, it's slowly growing and it is something which we're definitely also starting to, to look into as we, what we're finding is we provide a lot of architectural solutions where we have to then outsource guys who can provide those particular things and possibly moving forward in the future we're looking at bringing those in-house. Chatting to professional service firms, one of the difficulties that people have when they start out is it's the ability to get beyond just being involved completely in doing the work. Uh, with the three partners, how do you work on kind of looking after the business as well as looking after the clients? The way we've done it is we've apportioned a lot of the, the business tasks up, you know, such as financing or maintaining of uh, inventory within the business, keeping the computers running and all of that between the three of us. So we each have various tasks which we take care of. And the idea is that all of us must have a general knowledge of these various tasks, but one of us ultimately will have the full knowledge of that that particular task so that we're not fighting over you know who's doing what and how it should be done to a large extent. One of the challenges is distinguishing yourselves as a firm of architects from other architects. You've done it in terms of a brand identity but how do you do it in terms of promoting yourselves as architects? The branding like you said has definitely been a very a very big aspect of it. The, the other side of it is just that we've, we've really pushed a lot on the quality of our service to get it out there and also in terms of the way we approach our design to really try and not be doing the same kind of work over and over again so that the work is different continuously which when you look at some guys there you see the same details being repeated in their buildings you see similar work being repeated through their portfolios we've tried to keep our portfolio very diverse and paid quite a lot of attention to that. Does that not leave you short of an option in a sense that you don't define a style that that becomes your company's style? Yeah, to a degree, definitely. Um, but what we are noticing is that people are coming back and saying that there are definite you know, elements to our, to our buildings which you do start to see. And it, it, they normally revolve around the functionality of the building in terms of that you can actually see certain elements expressed. They don't look the same always, but there's definitely a big focus on expressing the functional elements of the building rather than window dressings, as an example. The building industry has been through a tough time in the last few years and you chose to start your business right in the middle of that. That must have been a bit of a challenge. When we started, it was, it, it was kind of, it, it was pretty much a now and never sort of scenario. You know, it was, we're just, you know, sort of coming into our 30s. Do we wait until our 40s before we start it? You know, in which case it's 10 years of slogging it out with somebody else, which then also has added responsibilities at that age versus where we were at the point when we started the business. And uh, the one big thing was, if we make it now, then we'll make it forever. Mike, can you give us some examples of the projects that you've worked on? The one was the, the Seed Library, which we did at the, the MC Weiler Primary School in the Alexandra Township. It was an initiative by the Mal Foundation. And uh, what we actually did there was we refurbished two shipping containers into this library, which sits in a crisscross manner on top of one another with your library for reading below and your uh, an informal reading space up above, um, which was that's probably one of the most challenging projects we've worked on, where a lot of it was prefabricated off-site and brought in on trucks. Then, on the other hand, we did a, a project, um, a, a, it's a jewelry kiosk in the Rosebank craft market for a company by the name of Sediba, which is an Anglo-American initiative for jewelry design. And they approached us to design a, a shop within a shop, essentially, which we also then had largely prefabricated out of steel and assembled within the shop. 
Thanks, Mike. That brings us to the rapid fire questions. What's the best advice you've ever received? To do the ordinarily, extraordinarily. And your best moment as an entrepreneur? Was definitely the opening of the seed library, where we realized that uh, through using so many different materials and uh, construction methods that we were not so used to, or that none of us had worked before, that uh, the only people holding us back was actually ourselves. And your biggest mistake? Probably bartering services with another company. What quality do you look for in people that you work with? Reliability and honesty. What do you think an entrepreneur needs to succeed? Definitely commitment, and you've got to really be able to see things through, even if it is to a bitter end rather than a, a good end. What inspires you as a small business owner? To be a big business owner. What would you do differently? Nothing really. Maybe have some more jam with my bread and butter. What makes South Africa a great place to be a business owner? South Africa's definitely got a lot of problems, and uh, I think, uh, like us, there are a lot of people out there who've got solutions for those problems. What keeps you awake at night? Coffee. And what gets you going in the morning? Probably also just coffee. Mike, thank you very much. Pleasure, thank you. And thank you for watching. We look forward to the coming weeks. We will bring you further South African entrepreneurs. I'm Paul Hobden. Thank you, and goodbye.